to see so many young faces. Uh, it is my pleasure to, today to introduce Dr. Liu Chalupa, who is Vice President for Research of uh, George Washington University, where I'm also serving as a faculty member. And uh, I'm going to be very brief. I just want to say that uh, Dr. Chalupa, for me at least, he basically a person the best term I can find for him is that a person who can connect the dots very, very well. So you will hear about his research, and the main topic of his research is to be able to connect certain neurons, certain you know, part of the uh, sensory system which we have in your eye to certain regions of the brain. And he did it extremely well, and he has many outstanding papers in the most prestigious journal, Science, Nature. It was funded for the studies for many, many years. You can find it online. But uh, as a person who worked with him for the past eight years, this ability to connect the dots probably mainly uh, I saw as his ability to establish different type of centers within our university. He established as many as eight or ten different centers uh, either related to science, to uh, autism centers, and different type of, uh, you know, uh, connections between completely different type of people who work in psychology, in medicine, in physics, but then he makes it work very, very well. So this has been a great success for our university to have this person who have this vision how you can take very different expertise and put it together and come up with something new. And uh, because maybe of this, I thought that maybe his next step will be connect dots, not only within the university, but uh, between the countries. So I kind of told him that, well, why don't you come to Armenia? That might be a good opportunity. So my hope is that that will be your next step, is to connect the dot between George Washington and American University of Armenia. And with that, I would like to give him a Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, first time to Armenia, and it's been a fantastic experience. Uh, this is a, clearly a, a, a up-and-coming university. Uh, you have a wonderful president who spent 37 years, as many of you know, at UC Berkeley. I spent 37 years at UC Davis, about 60 miles away, so we have something in common right away. And then I moved on to George Washington University. So uh, uh, this, this visit came. Uh, came along because about uh, seven or eight months ago, uh, my wife, Tanya, who's sitting here, and I had dinner with uh, Noreen, her husband, Arthur, at a very nice restaurant in uh, Washington, D.C. And they said, you know, you should come to Armenia and uh, see about doing a collaborative uh, arrangement between this wonderful university, American University of Armenia and George Washington University. And I said, sure. And so uh, one thing led to another, and here we are. And I'm so glad we came, because this really looks like a fantastic city and uh, at a fantastic university. So uh, I'm a neuroscientist, a brain researcher. I don't do any research anymore because now I'm an administrator and I help people like Noreen get grants. And, uh, but I, for many, many years, I, I worked on uh, various aspects of the visual system, particularly the development of the visual system uh, using mainly animal models. And so before I, I kind of start my lecture, I want to tell you, um, I'm going to give this talk in such a way that I'm going to assume you know nothing about the brain at all. So don't, so I'm going to just, you know, start from, the, from very basic things. So it's not going to be a real research talk, uh, which is for specialists. But I want to tell you uh, three basic facts about the brain that I think is absolutely correct, and anybody who is uh, in the business of brain sciences would agree to this. And some of these may surprise you, and some of these may not. So the first fact is uh, that the brain is the most complex, especially the human brain, of course, is the most uh, complex known and, and most complex organism in the known universe. There's nothing that approaches the complexity of the brain. And so just to give you some you know, figures, uh, we have on the order of 100 billion neurons. A neuron is a single nerve and um, nerve cell. And uh, those 100 billion neurons uh, form on the order of four to seven trillion connections in the, in the brain. 
But one neuron can form as many as 10,000 <coughs> connections. The, uh, so it's not just the number of neurons and the number of connections that they make with each other, but it's also the diversity of nerve cells. In all other organs in the body, there are one, two, or several types of cells. But in the brain, depending on what kind of criteria you use, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of neurons that are very distinct from each other. So for example, the smallest neuron in your brain, the smallest one, is on the order of about 30 microns in size. A micron is one one millionth of a meter. So you know what a meter state? It's one one millionth of that. So the smallest one is 30 microns. The largest neuron in your nervous system, the entire neuron, is one meter long. So it goes from something that you would need a very good microscope to see to something you could see just without any kind of problems. It was, it was out of the body. And so the, the complexity of the, of the brain is due to the number of neurons, the connections among the neurons, as well as the diversity of neurons. So there isn't any kind of thing that's one size fits all. And neurons communicate in different kinds of ways. The most common form of communication is by electrical signals that go along the neurons, and I'll show you some examples of those. And then between neurons, the communication is typically by the release of a chemical, a neurotransmitter, and there are many different kinds of neurotransmitters. But there's also other ways neurons communicate. Uh, some neurons in your brain, in my brain, communicate electrically. There's an electric connection between them, so that the signal jumps, essentially, across something called a gap junction, across from one neuron to the other. And the most interesting and uh, the least known way of communication, something has been found uh, now about 20 years ago, the people have found this one Nobel Prize, including somebody I hired, uh, one of Nobel Prize winners uh, for this I hired at George Washington University uh, about eight years ago. And that is they communicate by using a gas, a gas, nitric oxide is released. So three forms of communication, electrical, chemical, and, and gases. And, and different neurons use different types of communication, and, and that's what makes this system more, more complicated. So that's the first point I want to make. It's the most complex organ in a known universe. I said known universe because we may find some other universe someday that's something more complicated, but so far, no. The second point I want to make is that the brain is not a computer. A lot of people kind of think, well, the brain's like a computer. It is not at all like a computer. There are many people in Silicon Valley that are using the principles of brain organization, what we know so far, to try to develop more powerful computers on there. But a computer works completely differently. So here's one major difference. The processing information in computers is based on electron flows, which is instantaneous virtually. It's the speed of light. Information in the nervous system, by contrast, is conveyed very, very, very slowly. The fastest neurons in your body and my body send impulses, the fastest ones, at the rate of about 250 miles an hour. That's far away from the speed of light. A, a good Ferrari on a good racetrack can go that speed. Yeah. So communication by neurons is very slow, but yet we can make, so for example, uh, I just finished reading an interesting book by Gary Kasparov, who, this is a chess playing nation, so you know, uh, about his experience about le uh, losing to Deep Blue, the IBM machine. And he talks about how, how the chess machines, how they work, totally different from the way grandmasters play chess. Uh, a, a chess machine will, in one second, in one second, look at more than 200 million possible moves. Process all of those. Chess master doesn't do that. Doesn't say that, let me go, first moves. Just looks at that and instantaneously gets a grasp of the board and realizes what should be done next. But he still, he lost. <laughs> okay, eventually, the deep, deep look. So, so, uh, the, so that's the other point I want to make, that the functions of the brain are not the way the computers are, are, are being built today. Uh, the, the, uh, the, th the third point I want to make is that we, are, we have uh, learned more about the brain in the last, say, 20 years than the entire history of the world. And we're learning more and more and more and more. And we're learning so much not because you know, when the people are smarter doing the work today that we're doing it, say, 30 years ago. But because we have better and better techniques, techniques from molecular biology, uh, techniques from physics, techniques from computational stuff, and neuroscience, brain science, is an extremely collaborative enterprise, probably more than any other field of science. 
You have psychologists working with physicists. You have people that are, that are doing brain imaging, working with people who are studying worms, the nervous system of worms. It's really quite a remarkable thing. And in the United States, there is something called Society for Neuroscience, which encompasses members from all countries. They meet once a year. They'll be meeting this November in Washington. 40,000 people from around the world come. And there are all kinds of people working on all kinds of species and doing things. So we've learned more about the brain in the last 20 years than the history of the world. But in my judgment, we are understanding the brain today where the Wright brothers were when they first flew a plane about 80 feet in, in Kitty Hawk in North Carolina. So uh, our, our ignorance is vast. But because we have learned so much in the last uh, 20, 30 years or so, people have taken what we do know, and we know, you know a fair amount now compared to what we used to know, and they um, try to promote this in different ways in selling books and selling programs and so on. So there are all kinds of things, for example, a field of neuroeconomics. The idea is that you can, uh, you can make, um, understand economic decisions by people by studying their brain function. So it's a big field, it didn't exist five or six years ago. Whether that's true or not is yet to be determined. There's a whole huge industry in America about brain training, training your brain with all kinds of games and so on. You can see ads on television, you know, for this much, uh, $40 a month. Uh, we'll send you these programs and you can train your brain to be better. Who doesn't want their brain to be better? Does anybody here doesn't want their brain to be better? $40 a month, your brain will be better. Okay. There are books on uh, raising kids. I saw somebody brought a baby here. Where's that? Where, where's the baby here? Yeah. Okay. Great. You know. So I'll tell you. So one of the things that's really been hot is uh, on 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 how to get you know more intelligent children. What to do? And that's what I'm going to talk about. So so you should listen. The parents should listen there. And so and so so the question is, you know, how much of this stuff is hype, and how much of this stuff is real? And unfortunately, in my judgment, much, most of the stuff is hype. People do it because they want to make money. You know, America is a capitalist system, you may have read in the papers, and especially now in our current.